welcome to another special edition of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. Today we will be interviewing Hope Virgo, author of Stand Tall Little Girl. As always, we will be discussing a diverse range of mental health topics that may be distressing to some listeners. Please check the show notes before listening to any of our episodes. Welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with me, Sydney Timmins. And today I'm delighted to welcome to the podcast Hope Virgo, who is the author of Stand Tall Little Girl. So Hope, thank you so much for joining me. That's right, thanks for having me on. Before we get started, here's just a quick recap of the book blurb. I know how anorexia makes you feel. You think she is your friend. You think she can solve everything and make you feel amazing. But she will destroy you and everything around you, piece by piece. Hope Virgo. For four years, Hope managed to keep it hidden, keeping dark secrets from friends and family. But then, on 17th of November 2007, Hope's world changed forever. She was admitted to a mental health hospital. Her skin was yellowing, her heart was failing. She was barely recognisable. Forced to leave her family and friends, the hospital became her home. Over the next year, at her lowest ebb, Hope faced the biggest challenge of her life. She had to find the courage to beat her anorexia. In Stand Tall Little Girl, Hope shares her harrowing yet truly inspiring journey. So I was wondering if you could start by just giving us a little bit of background about who you are and why you decided to come out and openly write and speak about your journey with anorexia. So so my name is Hope Virgo and I wrote a book that came out back in March 2016 about my kind of journey from right from when I was born up through till probably halfway through 2016. And it basically documents my experiences of living with anorexia. I wanted to write about it because I think there's so many misconceptions around eating disorders. People don't fully understand it. They don't understand the impact that it has on a person's life. And I was getting slightly frustrated by things like that. And I also think as well, for me, whilst I manage my recovery really well now, I've had times throughout my whole recovery where I've kind of blipped a bit and found stuff really difficult. I relapsed in 2016. And I think with all of that, I kind of wanted to get the message out that actually you can get to a point where you can recover and life can be really good again. But you have to learn how to manage it. You have to learn how to cope with things. And I wanted other people who are battling with this kind of relentless, nagging, anorexic voice in their head to know that you can get to a much better place and it's 100% worth kind of battling to get to that point. I think that's a really important message. And I'm so glad that you are out there and speaking very openly. And I can understand that at times it must be extremely uncomfortable and raw, particularly with some of the things that you may have gone through, because it's not easy so when did your anorexia first start or did when you first noticed that it was something was going wrong? So it first started back when I was 12, 13 years old. So I had quite a messy family life and I was also sexually abused for around eight, nine months. And I found it really difficult to cope and express any sort of emotion. And so I started to skip meals and started to exercise much more. And as soon as I started to do that, this anorexic voice kind of gave me that sense of value again. And this purpose and this reassurance that I was really struggling for elsewhere. But the reality is with anorexia, and particularly for me, I didn't think I had anything the matter with me mm. for like the next four years. And I didn't, I, don't, I guess I just thought it was completely normal that I was exercising as much, that I was talking to this voice in my head. And I was kind of skipping a lot of meals. And I thought this was what people did. And it was normal. And the reality is it it wasn't normal. And it was really dangerous. And I think I probably only accepted I had something wrong with me when I ended up in hospital with it. Yeah, I was going to ask, at what point do you think things started to change for you? I know that you talk very openly about your hospital experience. And also kind of the competitive nature associated with anorexia and how you were all in a situation where you were in some ways trying to game what was going on. And I was wondering, when did you start to feel like you were getting back in control? Um, Probably in that year in hospital, I had moments when I felt like I was back in control. 
Yeah. But I think it's something that I, I do still struggle with from time to time. And I struggle with yes. kind of, yeah, I think when I have a really stressful period, particularly at work or kind of in my personal life, that I, there's that tendency that I want to go back to that control thing with calorie counting and controlling my exercise and things. And now I'm in a place where I can kind of resist that temptation. But I think kind of it's just something that I just have to live with and have to accept and find other ways to challenge yeah. things in a much healthier way. I think a real turning point for me was the first Friday night I was in hospital. I was completely fed up, like really unhappy. I'd basically spent like the last few days eating and sleeping because I wasn't allowed to do anything else. And um, someone, one of the nurses came in to see me and asked me to draw how I imagined myself on this massive brown piece of paper. Mm. And then she traced around me in, and I was wearing like just in my underwear and she got me to look at the images. And at first I thought she was lying and somehow she tricked me. But it was at that point that because the images were so different, I realized that something was slightly wrong with my brain and the way that I viewed myself. And it helped me to kind of, mm. I guess, get a bit of energy and a bit of kind of, I need to sort this out. I need to get better and try and get my life back on track. All I can say is I'm really glad that you have and that even though you're still in some ways fighting against your anorexia, you are, you seem to be doing much better. And I understand that as part of this book and your journey, you've been speaking at schools and on the television and in different blogs and news and stuff. What kind of things have you spoken about when you've gone onto those like TV shows and when you speak to teenagers and stuff? So with TV stuff I've done, it's mainly been around, I guess, sharing my story mm. and getting rid of all of the misconceptions that come with eating disorders. So one of my massive bugbearers around the way the NHS is funded is that mm. you don't get support with an eating disorder unless you're critically underweight. Yeah. And actually, there are so many people who are just functioning with anorexia, with other eating disorders. And that has such an impact on people with bulimia as well, because quite often they aren't going to be underweight, but they're just battling every day with their eating disorder. Yeah. Um, so I do a lot of work on things like that. So trying to make people aware that actually eating disorders come in all shapes and sizes. And just because someone starts eating, it doesn't mean that they're kind of completely fixed. Mm. I also um, I think do a lot of work uh, on kind of, I guess, the seriousness that anorexia is. So yeah. the reality is that people can live with anorexia a lot for a lot of their life and function, but it, you can also die from it. And people don't understand kind of the severity of it and quite often people think it's just a phase that someone's going through and it's like a diet that they might be on but all of that kind of understanding needs to change so that people can reach out for help when they need it exactly and it is a real yeah it's really frustrating and I think as well because of that competitive nature that you mentioned a minute ago mm. it does make it harder for people to get support because you don't you don't want to reach out unless you know you look like a good anorexic and mm. you're never going to feel like you look like a good one anyway but I actually did um, a talk a couple of weeks ago in a hospital and there was a woman in there. Who, uh, it was an adult ward and she had was in for borderline personality disorder, but she had anorexia as a secondary condition. Oh, no. And um, she wasn't rich. She did. She wasn't like, I guess, underweight by the NHS category. Yeah. And she asked me, should I lose the weight so that I look like a good anorexic? That's so sad, isn't it? Yeah, I was completely speechless. Yeah. I was just, like you don't there's no point doing that but no. it's hard I guess to get people to understand that yeah and I must admit I was kind of shocked when you talked about your relapse in your book and how you identified what was going on and you went okay I need some help with this and you went to try and get that help and because you didn't meet the weight criteria you were kind of turned away I thought that was shocking yeah, it's really, it is really frustrating. I think something needs to be changed so that if you have a relapse and you've already had a mental health problem, you get fast tracked or you get different care or something. Well, um, you can prevent but, it, couldn't you? They yeah, could have helped you. You need to invest more in. That's why I think this, as well, the school's work is so important because yeah. it's all about preventing. It's all about early intervention. It's about getting young people to kind of reach out for help when they need it and start talking about things more. Definitely. I was wondering. What kind of advice would you give with someone who is currently suffering with an eating disorder and for those that are dealing or trying to help someone with an eating disorder? Because I think one of the things that people find particularly difficult is knowing what to say and not wanting to make things worse. Yep. 
I yeah, I completely get that. And as a bit of a before I answer the question, it's a bit of a sidetrack. When That's I'm, good. I remember Go when I came out of hospital, people used to always comment on how healthy I looked. And when you say something like that to someone with an eating disorder, the healthiness means fat. And yeah. your mind goes into like complete turmoil over just a really and people don't mean any harm by saying you look healthy. But I think, yeah, so I guess it's important to think about the terminology that we're using mm. around each other. I normally suggest to people who are supporting people to try and avoid questions around weight um, mm. and to comment on appearance as much. I know when I was really unwell, my mum made a massive effort to take me out for walks once a week before just before I went into hospital. And so we would create these happy memories that were away from the house, away from meal times. So that when I look back over that kind of six month period just before I went into hospital, mm. it's not all kind of arguing and being completely wrapped up in this anorexia, but there is some nice memories in that as well. Yeah. So I think creating happy memories with people is really important. I think listening and not judging and being totally patient with someone. Quite often with eating disorders, you will confront someone about it and they will be in complete denial about whether they've got something the matter with them. And they'll think people don't understand what they're going through and all of this kind of stuff will go through their head. But if you're patient and you kind of go back to that at a later point, maybe in like six weeks time after you've had that first conversation, then they might be more open to talking about it. I also think having some kind of meal plan in place, particularly as a parent to support a young Mm. person. So to give that young person a bit of control over what they're going to be eating, but you supporting them to make sure they're eating the right stuff. They're kind of following a structure in their day. It's also really important to make sure that when you have a plan in place for a meal time, whether it's a location or a time, firstly, the person who's got the eating disorder or is in recovery is happy with that and actually maybe giving them a bit of choice over what restaurant you might be choosing to go to. But also making sure that if you've got that plan, do not change the plan last minute Yeah, because it can completely throw that person. And I think I remember for me, like in the last couple of years, I kind of picked restaurants that I'm happy eating in and I love going to. And one of the things I love going out for brunch because it's such an easy meal for me. Mm. And it's kind of so I kind of always suggest that to my friends. And they're always like, God, we always go out for brunch. And I'm like, I know we do, but it's because like I can completely switch off when I do it. But actually having those safe meals, I think is completely fine. I think it's important to challenge those and go to kind of more scary places at some point. But I think when you're first recovering and when you're trying to recover at first, going to easy places which you find safe to eat in is 100% fine. And making sure that by doing that, we're not then excluding people who've got eating disorders and they're not Mm. becoming completely socially isolated. Um, When I was unwell, a massive part of my illness was around exercise. Mm. And I got really obsessed with running and going to the gym a lot. And when I relapsed a couple of years uh, back, a couple of years ago now, I ended up getting a personal trainer just to have like a couple of sessions with to help me get back on top of my exercise. And whilst I think you've got to be so careful when you're exercising, and I wouldn't want to give kind of, I guess, medical advice on exercising when you've got in recovery from an eating disorder. But I think having conversations like that with people you're supporting and asking if they want to get a personal trainer to help them get back on track with things like that is also important. Um, And I think the main one is just kind of being there and being Mm. direct at times with people. I know I've got people around me that I completely trust. And when I ask them, if they think I look big today, that I know they're going to tell me the truth. And if I'm having a bad day, I can text them and tell them this is really difficult. And I think having those people around you is really important so that you start to, I guess, learn to express yourself without having to express yourself through food. So yeah, I think those are probably the main ones. I think for people who are struggling with an eating disorder, it's so difficult and you feel mm. completely wrapped up in it and you think that life is amazing and that you're completely invincible. But the reality is like your life is on hold and you're not living life as fully as you could be. Um, So what I did when I was in hospital was I wrote down my motivations for wanting to get well. So I wanted to go traveling one day. I wanted to get a job and I want to have children and all of this stuff Mm. I thought I could do if I had an eating disorder and life would just carry on. But the reality is you can't like you do miss out on so much of life. And I think just by recovering, like kind of, I guess, beginning to recover from an eating disorder, you're not going to get really fat. You're not going to lose control. You're still going to be a happy person. And the reality is you probably were never that happy when you were that skinny as well, because Mm. the anorexia will just start beating you up even more and making you feel worse about everything. And so I think it's learning to accept that and actually learning to start challenging and trying out different things and getting that like love of life back and realizing that 
whilst you do think that anorexic voice is the best thing in the world, it's not. And yeah. it will eventually kind of wear you down and drum you down. And then life is just not worth living when that happens. Well, that's very interesting and very useful for those that may be struggling and for those that are trying to support someone. And I love the fact that in your book that you included some excerpts from what your mum felt at the time and thinking back and what was happening. Because I think another thing, particularly when you speak about the fact that you were able to hide your anorexia for so long and people are busy, people have a family life is chaotic at the best of times. But I think that for parents, if they hadn't seen this kind of change in eating patterns and things, there must be such a lot of guilt associated with them when they realise this is happening and going on. So I just want to say that your mum sounds fantastic. So how is your relationship <laughs> with your mum now? How has it changed? Yes, it's really good, actually. So when I went into hospital, we pretty much, I pretty much hated her. Yeah. Um, I really struggled with her. And I don't think I was kind of angry that I was in hospital and I felt like it was her fault for not giving me this second chance to kind of try and get well on my own at home when the reality was we didn't have a choice when I went in. But we then, I guess we had a bit of a teething process over the next couple of years where we had to learn to kind of, I guess, have that relationship again and be able to trust each other. And now we get on really well. Um, We obviously argue occasionally like all daughters (laughs) do with their mums. But I know that like if I've got a problem, she'll come and she'll drop things for me and particularly kind of like food related stuff and with my mental health kind of more generally. When I relapsed, she came all the way to London, actually, just to come to like this hour long appointment with me. So it's things like that that actually I now feel like we support each other. And it's more, I guess it's now more like we're just friends. than yeah. like it's like a mum friend instead of like a proper mum, if that makes sense. Um, it does make sense. Yeah, she's yeah, it's brilliant. Actually. And we've had because she writes some of the book, as you know, mm. she I guess through that, we also kind of, I guess, developed our relationship even, even further and. I ended up apologizing a lot for some of the things that I'd done when I was really sick. And we talked openly about the impact that it had had on my family, particularly on my younger brother, who at the time I didn't think it was having an impact Mm. on him, but it obviously was having a massive one. And he was really upset by the whole thing. And my mum tried really hard to kind of shield everyone from what was going on. But you can't when it's so kind of obvious and in your face. And there were so many arguments about stuff. So I think kind of through writing the book and through her doing her bits in it, it's helped our relationship even further. Fantastic. I really do think that was a brilliant part of the book because it just gives you a better understanding of those. Because you're in that situation, it's really difficult to see outside of the situation. So I do think that was well worth putting into your book. I do think that's great. The other thing that I wanted to ask was, as a result of you speaking out more openly about your eating disorder, have you come across any stigma associated? Because you talked about you were trying to break some of the myths and increase awareness. Have people, have there been times when people have stigmatized you? Yeah, I think there has actually. I think uh, my relationship with some people has changed Mm. because of the way I talk about things. I think um, people ask a lot of strange questions to me about my eating disorder and about things I do and don't eat. And part of it, I guess, is them trying to understand it more. But I guess there's still, people still think, I guess people still think there is, they don't really fully understand it. And there is mm. kind of that attitude. I've had some from the telly stuff I've done. I've had some people kind of send me nasty messages saying people with eating disorders are self-centered and shouldn't be getting NHS support and all of this sort of stuff. But I think that's kind of just fueled me to mm. want to do this more. I think when I first started doing it and when I first got a couple of messages like that, I was really offended um, and like kind of got quite upset about it and really struggled. But actually, over the last six months, I'm kind of like, these people are the people that need to be educated more. It's not, they don't understand it. I'm so glad they haven't put you off. Yeah, same. <laughs> there has been times. Oh. Um, I think one of the strange things, I think, with anorexia is that when you... I do, I guess I still struggle with my body image from time to time. Yeah. And the shape I am now, I've probably never really been. And 
I when I stand up in front of a room of people, I know that they'll be looking at what I look like and do I look like I've got an eating disorder and mm. all of this sort of stuff. And they're probably not really thinking about it that much. But to me, I'm like, oh, my God, they're going to think stuff. They're going to like question me. Like, And I think sometimes the thing I do struggle with the most is whether it's hypocritical that I do still have bad days every now and again. And I share my story and talk so positively about it, yeah. which is why over the last kind of six months, I've made a really conscious effort to, I guess, try and be more open about stuff like that. So talking about when I have a bad day, I talk about it. And I'm like, yeah, it's a really difficult day today. But I'm not going to let the anorexia win and all of this sort of stuff, which I think is important because it's not an easy journey to get to kind of where I am. And it's not easy for anyone to kind of recover so I think yeah it's important to kind of just keep being honest about everything. It's fantastic that you are giving the positive message out there. As with all mental health issues I feel one of the biggest things that people have to face is this overwhelming sense of shame and with some of the things that you're saying it sounds like you have felt this and how does that impact you day to day? I think now I talk about it much more. So I talk to those around me and kind of get support that way. Mm. But yeah, I think there is. And I think there's some things that I did when I was really unwell that when I first wrote my book and when I first started talking openly, I kind of rushed over because I was embarrassed about it. And for example, I took, um, I take, used to take, uh, antidepressants and I took it and took them for a year mm. and a half. And when I first started talking about my recovery, I never mentioned the fact that I took citalopram. And I felt embarrassed that I'd taken it. And I had to kind of get over that stigma in my head that I'd had to take something to help me get better. And it's not a bad thing that I took it. So I think, I guess I'm just, I guess I'm learning along the way how to deal with the stigma that comes with stuff. And it's difficult. Yeah. And I think when you do kind of put yourself out there, people are all going to respond like totally differently. And you can't really predict that, which is what makes it harder, I guess, too. Yeah, exactly. So what kind of things are you doing now to ensure that you're staying as healthy as you can be? So I, I, I exercise. So I have kind of my time when I go to the gym or go running and I try and make sure that when I'm there, I don't look at my phone. I try and avoid social media when I'm in the gym and stuff, just so I'm not kind of distracted. And that's my thinking space and my time. Mm. I also have people around me that I talk to. So my boyfriend, my mum kind of people like that who when I'm having a bad day or something I can get that kind of support and download I also try and do stuff like self-care activities which for me I really struggle with I don't know why I struggle with it but I do and it's more just kind of trying to make I think a lot of people yeah and it's frustrating because it's like should be such an easy nice thing to do Mm. yes I'm trying to make time for things like that and I also try and go on holiday quite a lot just so that I've got kind of like a week where I'm not doing anything mental health related I think that sounds good I think working for myself you have and I'm sure a lot of people are like this as well you feel the need to constantly be working because if you're not working you're not making any money and it's like ridiculous but I think I'm learning I've learned over the last couple of months to get better at kind of keeping my time to myself and things like that but yeah the main one for me I think is talking about how I'm feeling and I guess with the food side of things I do have a healthy diet but like Mm. I try and challenge myself with my eating as well, which is tough at times and it's frustrating. But I think for me, I need to keep doing all of that sort of stuff to keep pushing further forward in my recovery. Can I ask, what kind of things go through your mind when you are trying to challenge your thought process in terms of food? Yeah, so uh, a good example, actually, yesterday I had ice cream, which I never have it I was so hot yesterday I know. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh. and it was I had a 99p flake which isn't 99p anymore obviously um I was <laughs> no it's like it 300 was. pounds it's ridiculous <laughs> um but um yeah and I had one and I knew that I was I basically before I had it I was like I'm gonna try and make myself have this I wanted to challenge myself with something and I've always wanted to try one so I was like I'm like just I'm gonna do it and I ate it quite quickly because I think I felt so nervous about it. And then I start trying to, in my head, I start to try and calculate how many calories it might have been. When do I, does it count as a snack? Does it count as a meal? Like all of that sort of stuff goes through my head. Mm. And I panic quite a lot when I'm doing something new like that. But then I now can be, I guess, I guess kind of reasonable, reasonable, that's probably not the right word, but with myself and actually 
yeah. bring myself back to the reality and distract myself afterwards um, by talking about something else or coming home. And I did some writing when I got back. So it kind of got me focused on something completely different. And then I woke up this morning and I still felt a bit anxious about the fact I'd had it. And I went for a run. And then on my run, I was like, oh, my God, I should be pushing myself. I should go for like a really, really long run to make myself feel better for it. But I didn't. I challenged that again. And part of it is when I'm challenging myself, I'm literally just telling the anorexia to just completely shut up. And I tell myself that other people eat ice cream all the time and they don't, doesn't have an impact on them and things like that. The most frustrating thing, I think, is when I go for dinner sometimes and I panic and mm. I then start to calculate all the calories on my plate, but then also all the calories on everyone else's plate. But then when that happens, I try and just bring myself back into the kind of reality of the room and talk to people around me so I think I've got kind of the distraction stuff in place but it's just it's sometimes just so frustrating when you have something like an ice cream which is, so everyone out well not everyone else, but a lot of people it's such an easy thing to eat and yeah then when you have it and you're kind of in that recovery point that voice in your head just starts bullying you again and gets really relentless mm. and it's just so frustrating and you're just like you just want to tell it to shut up and just leave you alone and but I think that's why for me it's important to keep challenging that because I know that tomorrow, like probably later on today, I'll feel fine about the fact I had an ice cream. Mm. But you just have to get over that kind of initial anxiety around it. Yeah. No, I can understand how frustrating it must be, particularly when people around you are just like, this is meant to be an enjoyable experience and you can't feel that enjoyment at that point in time because you are so anxious yeah. and worried. So yeah, it's yeah, it's just annoying. <laughs> yeah, I can definitely understand. And I think that's why a lot of people start to recover, and then you kind of give up, or you become so institutionalized with really easy, like easier meals mm. for that you. So when I first came out of hospital, I struck rigidly to the eating disorder plan that I'd been given in hospital. So I had set calories at each meal. I counted everything I was having, but you just can't live your life like that, and it's just not mm. fun. So I think that's why, yeah, for me, I just like keep trying to challenge it and I do encourage other people to try and do that too I definitely think that's a great tip for everyone in some ways to keep doing is challenging the way that your brain is reacting to something I was going to ask are you still in any kind of therapy now or have you moved on from therapy so when I was on hospital obviously just loads and loads of therapy yeah. and then I was discharged and did nothing up until 2016. Mm -hmm. And then in 2016, I did six sessions of uh, CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy. It didn't really work for me, if I'm mm. honest. I didn't really enjoy it. And I, I think I didn't really trust the person who was doing the CBT. So Which I didn't have that help. rapport with her. Yeah. So I stopped doing that after the six sessions. And since then, I haven't done anything. I have considered getting like a therapist or someone to talk to once a month just mainly because I come into contact with a lot of really unwell people and mm. I hear a lot of horrific stories about people struggling, like people who are struggling. And yeah. I think people open up to me a lot when I share my story, particularly in schools and hospitals. So whilst I have people that I talk to about that sort of stuff, I think... It's still difficult. Yeah, and I struggle because I want to help everyone and I kind mm. of want to fix everyone and make everyone know that they can get better and all of that sort of stuff. So I think... I'm looking at whether I want someone like that, that I can just kind of offload on every now and again. Might be worth it just for your peace of mind, because it can't be easy when you hear some of the stories that people have. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I think it's hard and it's sometimes frustrating, particularly in adult wards, because yeah. you have people who are struggling and they've been in this hospital for eight, nine years and you're just like, oh, oh my God, like please like sort it out kind of thing yeah. and I just it's more that frustration that I get now around things like that yeah so I think we're probably coming to the end I've got kind of an out there question yep if there was one thing you'd change about the mental health care system what would it be make sure that people focus more on prevention and early intervention I think it's yeah an absolutely no-brainer like we seem to wait till everyone hits crisis point we send turn people away if they if they come to the doctor and they're feeling suicidal, but they're not actually going to like they're not actually showing signs, mm. I guess, of killing themselves. And I think that's ridiculous. I think 
with eating disorders, we focus on the crisis point again, and we don't prevent anything. And which means that people end up in crisis, then in hospital for months and months and months, they become completely institutionalized. And then they can't kind of readjust and get back into the community. So that's my, yeah, that's what I want. I want people to stop, I guess, stop, yeah, stop waiting till crisis point has hit and getting help way sooner, but actually that help being available and accessible. Mm, That is a wonderful thing to want. And your work is fighting for that. So we will try and keep in touch and support you with with all the stuff that you're doing. So if anyone wants to stay in contact with you, where would they go to find you? So I've got a Facebook authors page. So it's just Hope Virgo dash author, um, where it has kind of all my blogs and various events I'm doing and kind of general updates on what I'm doing. And also I'm trying to document all of these challenges that I'm doing over the next year around my eating. So that's all on there. If people have got direct questions, they can contact me on the author's page or my email address is just hopevirgo at hotmail.com. So people can get in touch that way as well. And also I've got a website, which is just www.hopevirgo.com, which again, has a bit more information about me, about the kind of speaking stuff that I do and also events. So if I'm speaking, obviously a lot of the events I do are kind of private ones for companies and schools, but When there's bigger ones that I'm going to, like the Mental Wealth Festival that's happening in September in London, then you can kind of come to those events and I'll be around, obviously, for people to talk to. Well, thank you so much. And we at the Mental Health Book Club wish you well and keep up the fantastic work you're doing. And if there's anything that we can do to support you, just let us know. We are more than happy to help out as best we can. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. So in the meantime, it's okay not to be okay. If you're not okay, talk. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. If you need additional help with your mental health, please contact the Samaritans on 116-123, which is a 24-hour helpline. And if you need additional information about mental health issues, please visit MIND at mind.org.uk Our next book will be A Beginner's Guide to Being Mental An A to Z from Anxiety to Zero Given by Natasha Devon, MBE If you'd like to find out more about eating disorders from The Secret Psychiatrist please refer to episode 33 of the Mental Health Book Club podcast and our next episode with The Secret Psychiatrist will be on ADHD We really hope that you enjoy this podcast and we would like to hear what you think. Please head over to Twitter, follow us at MHBC underscore podcast or head over to Facebook and follow our Facebook page, which is Mental Health Book Club. If you would like to show your support further, please share us with your family and friends and leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. 